This is a chapter that I will not be able to completely get through today, so it'll take a piece of another class period to finish it, but uh, one reason is there's a lot of birds, and there's a lot of topics within birds to, to talk about, and the, the author brings out the fact that birds being uh, extremely beautiful in a lot of cases, I mean, there's color in birds that you didn't know that mix of color could actually happen. Wood ducks, uh, turkeys, I mean, there's just, there's some beautiful birds out there and some really weird colors in some of these birds. So because of color and because there's a lot of them, because they make a lot of beautiful noises, they sing in a lot of cases. Uh, so they consider them melodious, that'd be the singing aspect. I guess we could say melodious, right? Melodious. They're probably one of the most uh, looked and sought after animals that we've talked about so far, simply because people are interested in birds. There's a lot of bird watchers out there. And if you ever get a chance in an upper level to take an, an AB's class, a bird class, it is a very interesting class. If you get a good instructor, they'll, they'll take you out in the field and you'll get binoculars and you start bird watching and identifying birds. And especially their migratory season, fall and spring, when you have birds headed out that's coming through here that didn't summer here that you didn't see all summer, or birds coming back through here that's going somewhere else that wasn't here all winter, and you see those odd birds, it's pretty cool. So this is one of my favorite chapters. It's, it's second number to fishes when you come to bony fishes, when you, when you come to vertebrates. And uh, it's second to fishes in favoritism for me. Uh, so there, like I said, there's a lot to say here. 9,700 species. And when it comes to the vertebrates, that's second in number only to fishes. Uh, of course, if you take out just vertebrates and say of all animals, it would be third to in insecta, class insecta. What is the one feature that puts a bird in this category? Those are two common answers, and as close as they may be, it's not the correct answer. He said capability of flying, she said wings. Oh, we're getting technical. <laughs> That's a great feature. We're going to pinpoint that feature, but that's not the one feature that makes a bird a bird. Feathers. Feathers. That's where they come up. Birds of a feather flock together. There it is. It's feathers. And one thing this, he brings up a unique point here. This book does not cover this. It, it's crazy. It should be in every chapter. You have two categories of birds. You have one called ray type and another called carinate. Yeah, I took a bird class, so man, I'm up on birds. Ray type birds do not fly. That's why you categorize them this way. Carinate birds fly. And ray type literally in Latin means flightless. Carinate means a keeled sternum. In other words, they have a big breast, which that's the that's the two main muscles involved in suppressing and depressing the wings and uh, pectoralis and supracorcortis are the two muscles. And uh, the pectoralis is the largest because it has to do the most work. And so carinate birds fly, great type birds don't. Now, when we get over toward the end, there'll, there'll be another couple of categories of birds. And, uh, and basically it'll, it'll set apart birds that are hatched with down on them like chickens and fowl. As soon as the down dries, they're ready to go with mom and travel, whether it be swimming across a pond or walking across a field, they're ready to go. And most all your common fowl are like that. Or there'll be another group of birds that are considered, when they're hatched, they're naked and helpless. And that could be uh, birds of prey. Uh, the order passer forms that I mentioned earlier, which is 60% of all birds, and that's songbirds, where both parents are essential got to have both parents just to keep enough food in their mouth. So, you know, that, that the type of bird it is will, will play a huge role on whether it requires both parents or not to keep these offspring alive. So, anyway, uh, it touches on that right at the end, and we'll get to that one as we, as we get to it. So, 
we'll find that most all birds uh, specialize, and there's the largest group specializing in some kind of capability of flight. And so the entire bird's anatomy is built for that. Even to the point of, of the spine being somewhat fused together, uh, there's a little bit of looseness in the neck where they can move the neck, but if everything's fused together and more solid, and even getting down to the mass of the legs is in the upper part and very, you have tendons and thick skin in the bottom part, even so tough that it's hard for them to freeze, but even the center of gravity is confined to a, a bulky mass in the middle. And so built for flight in that aspect, built for flight with hollow bones that was mentioned. In fact, you can take all the bones of the largest bird out there called the frigate bird with a seven foot wing span and pile all of his bones in one pile and pile all of his feathers in another pile and the feathers will outweigh the bones. That's how unique the bone structure is. And birds of flight will have seven interconnecting air sacs that store excess oxygen for strenuous flight exercise. Their lungs can't always, you ever reach a point, if, I mean, if you went out here and somebody told you to sprint from here to the student union, you think you'd make it alive? Oxygen content would become rather low in me by the time I got outside the building. <laughs> so in their case, they use reserve. They may not have the option of stopping if they're migrating across the ocean. Some of these birds don't float very well, and if they do, they're really good bait for something else. So that's not an option. So they have the air sacs with stored oxygen that gets them that extra mile they need to go. And by the time they use that, the lungs have time to pick back up. And then when you find the resting spot, we restore and resupply. And here we go again. So there's a lot of things we're gonna touch in here. And, and if you have your study guide handy, I'll pinpoint some things as we go through it. I'll know on that study guide. One of the things on the study guide is what type of food do birds eat? I don't know what number that is. You have it? It's 15. They have an energy rich diet. So it's not looking for precise, this bird eats sugar berries. It's an energy rich diet, which is typically seasonal. Now they're not gonna have any kind of berry to eat year round. So it's an energy rich diet, which a lot of seeds are involved in that. We eat a lot of seeds, don't we? Beans, peas, those are seeds that are very high energy foods. Birds love them. So high energy, in fact, 591 is where they have it. An energy rich diet that is seasonal. Birds have to maintain a high metabolic rate. Smaller the bird, higher metabolism, less life longevity as well, as we'll see when we go through here. It says birds have superb vision. That's probably their number one sense, and it is better than ours. They have the number one vision of all animals. A hawk can see eight times better than we can. An owl can see 10 times better. Do we have good vision? Compared to birds? No, compared to everything else? Yes, very good vision. We have one advantage over most birds. What would that be? binocular vision, which gives us depth perception. Our eyes are set in front of our face. And so it makes no sense when you run into that sliding glass door that some of y'all have done before. <laughs> Broken. Oh, you shouldn't have said that. But uh, I love the crow commercials, you know, <laughs> the Windex crow commercials. I love those commercials. But uh, how many times have you seen birds fly into sliding glass doors or windows and I mean, I, I've seen them actually kill them, just break their neck and they're dead. Well, darn, if they had binocular vision, they might have picked that up. But not always, because we have proof of that. We walk into them ourselves. But binocular vision gives you depth perception. The only birds out there that need that are birds of prey. If a bird of prey is sitting out in this tree out here and looking for a rabbit or a rat or a mouse with eight times better vision than we have, it spots it a kilometer away <laughs> when we say, what? We couldn't see it. And he goes over there and dives down. He better judge distance if he's diving head first, wouldn't you agree? Even not diving head first, he needs to be able to judge distance to know when to, to pull up and 
stick to talons through and through, which we'll get to that as well. But vision is number one. Now, do they have good hearing? Yes. Their ears are almost identical to ours, except they're, they're kind of like a miniature replica of ours. Yet, they can hear a wider range of pitches, and if they damage their ears, they can fix them. Now, that's wrong. We can't fix ours. If we damage ours, we're done, aren't we? Unfortunately, yes. We've been studying the bird ear for years and years and years, hoping, hoping to figure out how they replenish their ears so we can apply it to ours, but we've yet to figure it out. And they have another unique feature on their eyes, and we still don't know what the purpose of this is. It's called pectin, and it's a covering in the eye. Obviously, protection, but is that all it is? Some say it, it's a nourishing factor of the eye. I have no idea. They really don't know either. They have some theories. You can read through it and look at the theories, but we really don't know. But they do have a pectin. All right, moving on from there to we get into feathers. And we have all kinds of feathers, but feathers are basically made, especially contour feathers. This is what they're going to describe, and we're over on 595 now. Consists of a hollow quill, also known as a calamus, emerging from a skin follicle and a shaft or ratchet, which is a continuation of the quill and bears numerous barbs. The barbs are arranged, and I'm, I'm going to read this little description here, and then you tell me what that describes in your mind. What, what does it remind you of? Okay. The barbs are arranged in closely parallel fashion and spread diagonally outward from both sides of the central shaft to form a flat, expansive web surface, the vein. There may be several hundred barbs in a vein. Through a microscope, each barb appears to be a miniature replica of the feather with numerous parallel filaments called barbules set in each side of the barb and spreading laterally from it. There may be 600 barbules on each side of a barb with, with more than one million barbules for the feather. Barbules of one barb overlap barbules of a neighboring barb in a herringbone pattern and are held together with great tenacity with tiny hooks. Should adjoining barbs become separated, considerable force to do that, they can be instantly zipped together by drawing a feather through your fingers, which some of us have done that at some point in life. What is that describing that we use every day in our life? Velcro. That's exactly right. I don't know if that's a test. It uh, seems like that's something on the study guide, too. But feathers are made like Velcro. A bird spends a massive amount of their life preening. Preening is a term that they use their beak to repair their feathers. And they've got a little oil gland back by their tail feathers, and they'll reach back there and get a little oil on their beak, and it'll help them to smooth out the feathers and the, and the zip. We can take a feather and run it through our fingers and we can zip back nearly the whole thing. It takes him hours to zip back a feather, but they spend a lot of time of their life keeping their feathers in good shape because that's essential for flight. It's essential for escape and well-being. Types of feathers. We have contour feathers, we have flight feathers, we have fiddle plume feathers. Anybody ever been involved with grandma and grandpa butchering a chicken? Holly, I know you butchered a chicken. Nobody else? I butchered a billion of them. You butchered a billion of them? Chicken five years. Oh, you've been there. It was you involved in, y'all just ripped the skin off most of them, don't you? Do you pluck many at the plant? No. Not many Boil pluck. Boil it off. Boil it off. So, well, when, when Grandma did it, she asked she did the same thing. She'd take this chicken and dip it in boiling hot water. And that would scald the feathers where they basically fell off, but we'd take and pluck them all off and they'd come off a lot easier. Now, if you just took a, a, a chicken that you just pulled its head off and started pulling feathers, you'd be there forever, and you wouldn't get all the feather pieces and parts. But by boiling it, the skin turns loose of this feather, which is a dead structure. It's just like hair on your head. It, the feather itself is a dead structure. But when Grandma would get finished, all the feathers are gone. If you held it up in the light, you can see all these little hairs. Now, the hairs are called filiplume feathers. So what do y'all do with the hairs? We can burn them off. Yeah. Or say, send them somebody else, let them deal with those, right? 
Grandma would burn them off. That's exactly what she, my grandmother would have a feed sack out there, an empty feed sack. She'd set it on fire, get enough flame going. She'd just take the flame all the way around the chicken, and it would send all the hairs back, and we was good to go. I mean, that's it. It's much more difficult to pluck a chicken than it is to skin a chicken. Skin is easy, but but the skin sometimes holds taste. And depending on what grandma was going to do with that chicken, if she was going to fry it. She wanted skin on it because it held moisture and it held taste and it held a held the fat content. But if she's just going to make dumplings out of it, it she'd probably go ahead and skin it and throw it in the pot because she's got to cook it down anyway. So it just it just depends. So that's a fillet plume feather. Then your down feathers are closest to the body. It really holds the warmth for them. And then powdery down feathers is only found on certain species. And they list bitterns, hawks, and parrots, and a few herons that may have those as well. Origin and development. Well, as we said, it comes from live structure, but becomes it comes from a live structure and becomes a dead structure as it develops. And it actually unrolls. It unrolls out of skin, and like our hair that just grows up out of skin, a feather will unroll itself. And they describe that as unrolling itself out of a hollow cylinder. Move on over to 596 and we get into molting. Now that we've grown the feathers, we have to molt them and grow them back because after a while, all feathers will get worn down. Well, here's you a test question. This is a study guide question somewhere on there. Uh, I'll ask, how are feathers shed? What number is that? 20. Number 20. They are shed in a highly orderly manner. In fact, the second sentence says, shedding or molting of feathers is a highly orderly process. So what is that saying? That's saying if we lose two feathers off the tip of the left wing, we're going to lose the same two feathers off the tip of the right wing. And we're going to grow, as we grow those back, we may lose two more down beyond that as these come back. Typically, they don't shed them all at once. Now, waterfowl will tend to shed all their flight feathers at once, which will actually ground them, not capable of flying. But this is usually in the summertime when they're living in Canada in cooler weather, and they have lots of water in Canada so they can live out on the lake and not be threatened by a mass of predators. So and that's a temporary time frame. But the only one that they claim in the book, and the way the book reads, it took me a long time to really think about this, the way the book reads, it, it reads, that penguins shed all their feathers at once. So I can just imagine a penguin popping out of the water, living on the bank here a couple days, and say, oh, it's time to shed, and they just drop their clothes, and we have a naked penguin sitting there. That's what, it, I mean, that's what it reads. It says, uh, feathers are discarded gradually to avoid appearance of bare spots, and that's with the average, the average bird we're familiar with, chicken or whatever. And then uh, flight and tail feathers are lost in exact pairs, just what we was talking about. Then it says replacement emerges from the next pair as the next pair is lost and merge uh, and most birds can continue to fly unimpaired during the molting. Down below that it says, uh, well I know it says it somewhere in there. Where does it say the penguins? Except in penguins. Except in penguins. I'm still not seeing it, but I know it's there because I saw it yesterday. Oh, feathers are shed all at once except in penguins, which molt. Uh, Feathers are shed in a highly process except in penguins who molt all at once. So they, to me, they just leave it out there and wide open that it just shucks as all, all the feathers fall off and he stands there until he grows feathers back. And that would be one ugly little bird, wouldn't it? That's just, that's just not right. So uh, he pretty much does his molting in a short time frame is what they're saying. And, and there'll be bare spots and there'll be naked spots. And, you're going to grow back pretty fast. It's just not as in the orderly process of all other birds is what they're saying. The skeleton we pretty much covered. We know it's pneumatized bones, which means hollow. The bones are lightweight. They're, they're made for flight. We pretty much covered that. We also talked about how the uh, vertebrae are fused together to maintain a center of gravity. Uh, bones in, of the forelimbs are all modified for flight. Uh, it's specialized. The muscular system, we have two muscles. We have the pectoralis and supracorcoris. The pectoralis depresses the wings, which is going to give you a lift, so that's going to do most of your work. And the supracorcoris is going to raise the wings to, to depress again, so that does the least amount of work. Now, a few species of birds are hovering birds, like a, 
a hummingbird. A hovering bird, those, both those muscles are well developed because you're going to have to really depress and suppress really fast. So those are the main ones involved there. Now when you're getting into muscles down in the legs, I mean granted, what, what, what's your favorite part of a chicken to eat? A lot of people likes the leg. It's a convenient aspect as much as anything. But probably the breast is the most popular because if you buy quality chicken nuggets, I'm not saying Mick nuggets, I'm saying quality chicken nuggets or chicken strips, or if you just buy it, go down the store and you buy a chicken breast, is that not overall the best meat on the chicken? Well, and the second choice for everybody would be the chicken leg probably. So when you get down the muscle, the muscle mass on the leg is held really in one area. Because when you hold the bottom of the leg, you're not holding anything but bone down there, right? The only thing that goes through there is the ligaments and stuff. And the ligaments goes down the leg into the foot. And that's what they're talking about here is that the most of the mass is in the upper part of the leg. The rest of the foot is bone, ligaments, and skin. Okay, so because of this, this these ligaments running down through there, birds have what's called an ingenious toe-locking mechanism. And this toe-locking mechanism is a tendon that runs down through the, the elbow or the knee area of the bird and into the feet or the toes of the bird. And this tendon, it technically, it's perfect size, but technically it's too short, and that's what makes this work. When the leg is extended, the tendon's perfect length for the toes to be spread out. But as, as the bird would sit down or bend the leg, it automatically draws the toes because the tendon's too short for the toes to extend. A bird cannot extend their toes with their legs pulled up underneath them. And so if they sit down on the roost, they find a nice limb to sit down up in a tree at night. When they sit down, they're locked in. You ever wonder why after a windy or a tornado night you don't see birds laying all over the ground the next morning? Well, they've been blown out of the tree, right? As long as they stay set down like that, the wind may have spun them around the limb, but they hung on. <laughs> they may have been a little dizzy the next morning, but that toe locking mechanism, what does it? And birds of prey, if you think about it, look at the momentum, a hawk or an eagle or an osprey or, or an owl, look at the momentum they have attacking this rabbit. To the point when they stop, their body weight is going to suppress their legs, right? To the point if they land on the rabbit, and momentum pushes their body weight into their legs and their leg comes up, guess what happens to the rabbit? The talons will pierce the rabbit through and through, literally causing death of the rabbit at that point. And then when they take off, being high lift wings that we'll talk about here in just a minute, when they take off, they keep their legs pulled up, which they hold on to the rabbit. If they ever extended their leg, then lose grip and lose the rabbit. So. That's how the muscular system works and their ingenious toe locking mechanism works. They have an excerpt over on 599 that a guy named L. Brown wrote, and it's saying the same thing. When an eagle grips in earnest, one's hand must become, uh, hand becomes numb. It's quite impossible to tear it free or to loosen the grip of the eagle's toes with the other hand. One just has to wait until the bird relents, and while waiting, one has ample time to realize that an animal such as a rabbit would be quickly paralyzed, unable to draw breath, and perhaps pierce through and through with the talons in such a clutch. So there it is. Food and feeding. Well, as, as far as birds go, we already know what type of food that they eat. Now, every bird specializes in their type of food. You can see the different kinds of beaks there on the right hand, on the left hand page. You no know, raven's got to be a favorite because that beak will do anything. It's a general beak. That beak will eat grandma's pie or your pecan. It doesn't matter. Uh, I saw, anybody ever read Far Side cartoons? Are you familiar with Far Side cartoons? Oh, boy. Please, my joke's out these days. But far Side cartoons are science-based cartoons. And science-based meaning there's, there's an animal involved in it somehow. And it, the one that I think I still have it in my office somewhere, I've cut it out because it had it had two old crows sitting up on a highline wire, and a semi had just run over an elephant. Yeah, this elephant was just plastered in the highway. 
And then the caption on the crows was, a crow's dream. I mean, he could eat on this all day. You ever seen crows picking at roadkill? Sure. Well, crows, crows have attacked my lunch when I've been camping before. They <laughs> broke into the bread. Whatever, you leave it out, chips, it doesn't matter. A crow will eat anything. <coughs> Ravens or crows, whatever you want to call them. Old crow. So cardinals or seed crackers. American Avocet, worm burrow probe. Pelicans, a dip net. Parrots, a nutcracker. Flamingos, zooplankton. Filter feeder, if you will. And he is a fish spear. And eagles, a meat tear. So you can see all these little funky looking beaks are specialized in the food sources that they eat. So most of them have a crop. Food goes down the hatch into the crop. Crops for storage. Go from the crop to the gizzard. Gizzard's just a muscle with a, a good year rubber lining. I mean, it, it is a tough rubber lining on the inside of that gizzard. And people say, well, gizzard's tough, you can't eat them. Well, that's, that's a, a highly worked muscle in a bird. But if you take off the rubber lining, it's just another muscle. I've known people to clean gizzards and think they're gonna cook gizzards up and then they chew on them forever. They didn't take off the rubber lining. Why wouldn't you peel the rubber lining off? That's where all the food is ground up. Just think about how tough it's got to be. Some of these seeds they eat are hard as a rock, aren't they? Throw corn out there, is corn pretty hard? You can't take it and mash it, can you? And they've got to grind this up. So a lot of these birds, what they'll do is go out and get something harder than what they're eating to put in their crop and gizzard. It'll eventually make it to the gizzard. So the gizzard muscle has something to work against the food that they're trying to break up. You know what you'll find in there most often? One of two things, if not both. Gravel, Gravel rocks, and glass. So well, that glass will cut them all to pieces. It won't cut that, that good year lining. <laughs> it's tough, I'm telling you. But it, it will cut all the seed products that they eat. And after a while, the rock or the glass will actually smooth over, and it'll grind the edges off of them, and they'll go get some more. <laughs> How many times have you seen turtle doves fly from the side of the road? Yeah, well, you got to know what turtle does look like, don't you? Well, we got a lot to learn in here. As I tell you, I used to think I was teaching country folk around here that knew a lot of what I grew up with, but y'all don't pay a lot of attention. You ever seen the Geico commercials where the squirrels would get out in the road and cause a wreck? Anybody ever see that one? It's one of my favorites. The squirrels give each other a high five because they cause a wreck. Well, these birds. I mean, you've seen birds in the edge of the road that fly in front of you. Those are probably turtle doves. Okay? They're not there because Geico paid them to be there. They're there because they're picking up rocks on the side of the road or glass or somebody's throwing a beer bottle out and they thought they'd get a little beer taste while they was getting a piece of that bottle. And they, and they wait till the last minute and say, oh, here comes a car. Wait just a minute. And right in front of you. And you go, Cause red. Well, they're getting those things in their crop, which will end up in the gizzard to grind up the fruit, food processes or the food components that they're going to consume. And actually, out of some of the rocks, they'll get enough calcium that'll help for eggshell development. And uh, if you take calcium supplement, if you, uh, if you go to Walmart and buy the cheapest calcium supplement you can buy, it's probably an oyster shell based supplement, you'd be just as good, just as well off sharing those rocks with those doves. That's how much you're gonna get out of it. Out of a 500 milligram tablet of oyster shell calcium, your body will get 50 milligrams out of it. Now I'm not telling you to go chew on some rocks. I'm just telling you that's not money well spent buying oyster shells because we don't digest it very well. All right, so that makes us through the digestive system. Uh, except for the fact that when everything's done, an excretion, or maybe excretion is going to be on the next page. So I'll go ahead and do excretion. When we get to the excretory aspect of it, we don't have urine in birds. Now, granted, some bird species are more loose than other birds, but they literally take the uric acid that would be in our urine and create a paste out of it. And if you've ever noticed bird poop, I'm sure all of y'all have walked around looking at bird poop. There's your outside assignment for fall break. Go find some bird poop. You'll see a white streak in it. The white streak is the uric acid. That's what, when it lands on your vehicle, that's what dulls the paint. Now you know. You've always heard bird poop would dull your paint. Of course, I don't want any poop on my vehicle, but 
it will because of acid, because they solidify the acids. Now, birds that live around marine areas, would you say they'd eat a lot of salty food? Seagulls would eat a lot of salty food, so they have another problem to deal with, excess salt. They have two ways to get rid of it. They excrete it in the feces, which get, makes their feces really runny. So if you've ever been around gulls, anybody? They're nasty. I mean, they, if, if you find a place where gulls perch a lot, that's going to be where they poop a lot. And if they may have just pooped three or four times. It'll cover an area that big because it'll just splatter. I mean, it's just nasty. So the type of food they eat. The other way they get rid of the excess salt is they have special salt secreting glands in the corner of their eye. Would you like to have a salt gland in the corner of your eye? So if you think about it, these gulls, they, and it runs, the salt glands produce the, the salt secretion through their nose. So it actually gives them a runny nose all the time, and it makes them look like they've been on a drinking binge. So they have these bloodshot eyes and a snotty nose all the time. Does it get any nastier than this little bird? So man, he's been drinking a lot all night. Look at his bloodshot eyes. Look at that runny nose. And geez, look at this crap. It hey, doesn't get any nastier than that. But that's, that's, that's the excretion aspect of birds. Now, it'll tell you in there that their capabilities are, oh, anywhere from four to eight times of concentration of the blood as far as getting rid of waste. Uh, mammals do a lot better. Uh, we don't. We're, we're about 4.2 times that of blood osmotic concentration when it comes to waste components uh, and dealing with uh, dehydration or water. Um, a camel, which you'd think deals with does well in a desert air environment. Well, it doubles what we do. They're about eight times. They can concentrate blood osmotic concentration. Anybody ever had a pet gerbil? Gerbils can concentrate 14 times that. So you clean that cage all the time or mom and dad's ready to kill you and the gerbil because those things stink. And then you get into the one that's most significant uh, because the environment it lives in, he has no moisture to consume at all. All the moisture that this animal gets is completely from the food sources he eats. 10% of free moisture, 90% of metabolic moisture from breaking down the food. And that's the Australian hopping mouse. That's one unique little mouse. He can concentrate his urine 25 times out of blood osmotic concentration. Now a little bit of that urine would stink up a cage in a whole fast way. So. There is specialties out there in these different animals. They're going to tell you in that section as well. The circulatory system, four-chambered heart, closed system, pretty high pressure. Pretty high pressure. Heart rates, they give you some examples. A turkey heart rate's 93. The, a good way to remember this is larger the bird, slower the heart rate. You drop from a turkey to a chicken, we're at 250 beats a minute. So longevity of turkey, would you probably assume it's a longer lifespan than a chicken? Sure, I would agree. Then you go to a black cat chickadee. A black cat, somebody, who's got the birds? Y'all doing birds? Somewhere in that report, put a black cat chickadee in there. Make a note of that. We've got to have a picture of a black cat chickadee. And that'll be in the songbird category. And that'll be naked and helpless in the offspring. So that is a type of reproduction that will require both parents. So. That's, that'd be your example of that. The black cap chickadee at rest, his heart beats 500 beats a minute. When he's busy finding food, whatever he has to do, but he's busy, it jumps to 1,000 beats a minute. Now, if you could sneak up on that bird and go boo, you could kill him because he can't afford to skip a beat at 1,000 beats a minute. Can we afford it at 70? We can skip a beat. We may not feel well, but we we'll skip a beat and pick right back up and keep it going. Not that bird. You'd kill him. Sure enough. So there's your circulatory system. Respiratory system, we already talked about air sacs, and that's your primary thing. Uh, lung system's basically like ours, where it's, in, it's all internal. It's very good for terrestrial, but we have the nine interconnecting air sacs. That's the big thing about birds. The nervous and sensory system. Uh, cerebral, the, the brain of a bird has a well-developed cerebral hemisphere. 
the cerebellum, and optic lobes. Now, if you think about those two things, we already said the bird's eye sight's really good. So it makes sense optic lobes are going to be large. Cerebellum. Do you think birds have to be pretty well coordinated to fly? What about birds flying in, in forested areas? If I was flying through a forested area, I'd miss a limb and it'd close hang me, just flip me right there, I'd be done. Or I'd be saying, well, I missed that tree, bam, hit this one. You know, that, that'd be, birds, you don't see birds doing that in forest because of well-developed cerebellum. And then the cerebral cortex, the chief coordinating center of mammalian brain, and that would be us, that'd give us reasoning and thinking and uh, planning capabilities, poor at a bird, very poor, very poorly developed and unfissured, very thin. Fissures are, they're really talking about convolutions. Convolutions are raised in lower areas on the brain. Our brain has the greatest amount of convolutions of any animal. And what that does is increase surface area for greater capability of thinking and reasoning and planning and those kind of things. In a bird, they just describe it as no fissures, thin, flat, nearly non-existent. Is that why the bird keeps building the nest in the same place? He's gonna knock it down every day. Either that or they're really stubborn. <laughs> yep, they get their mind set on something. The uh, cerebellum is large and the optic lobes are large, so that's what we're getting now. As far as just the, that, and that's a major part of the cerebral hemisphere is what they're pointing out here. Then they talk about the ear. We already mentioned the ear. We feel a little cheated on the ear because they can fix theirs if something goes bad and it's smaller than ours and they can hear a wider range of pitch. On the eye, we said their eyesight's better than ours. They talk about it as well. And they have this covering called a pectum. We still don't know much about that. Then we move into flight. On 605, as we move into flight, they call it flapping flight. I don't know what else you would call it. How else do you fly except flapping your wings? That's not true flight. So it's falling. Now that's when they get into flying mammals. They'll list a squirrel. There is no such thing as a true flying squirrel. Now, do we have a flying mammal? A bat. That's it. Flying squirrels are gliding squirrels. And we have a lot of them in Oklahoma. In fact, they have a huge abundance of them down in Curtin County. I was down at Lake Broken Bow. Well, it was in July, I guess. It's pretty hot. I was down there and took my two little ones down there to see if I could drown them, but they survived. <laughs> and uh, run into one of the wildlife managers down there who was a former student, come through this very same class right here at Carl Albert, grew up in Pecola. And he had got out at daylight, and, and they have traps for these little squirrels, and, and they try to relocate them because there's quite an abundance of them. And, and he had one, and he brought one over there. Just so happened about the time we was taking the boat out of the water, here he comes, and so he shows it to, and he turns it loose right there. He just throws it up in the air, and it glides down, takes off running. Well, kids thought that was pretty cool. And it is pretty cool. They're little bitty rascals. They're not very big at all, but boy, they've got a lot of loose skin. And they glide. They don't, a flying animal has to stand in one place and be able to go up there. That squirrel starts up there and ends up down there. You don't see him starting there. And he climbs up there and then jumps. <laughs> so there's a difference. So flapping flight. You, your greatest power is involved in the downstroke, obviously, because you're pumping the weight of the animal. Different types of wings here. We have elliptical wings. These are your, a lot of your birds that live in forested areas. Warblers, sparrows, doves, woodpeckers, magpies. They have low aspect ratio. And their wings are, are made to the point where they can uh, make sharp turns without stalling and falling. I mean, they can dip and dive and cruise and whatever they need. But they typically are not good at, at longevity, at long distance flight, good short flight. High aspect weight ratio wings. These are swallows, hummingbirds, swifts, pop, uh, poppers, sandpipers, uh, terns, and gulls. These tend to make really long migratory treks. And the fastest birds known is in this category. Sandpipers clocked at 105 miles an hour, 109 miles an hour. You know, if that dude goes by you, you probably didn't see it. You probably heard something. What was that? And that's how fast they can, they can move. Dynamic soaring wings. These tend to hover above uh, air currents. It's created by cooling and warming of waters, so ocean waters, albatrosses. Uh, Shearwaters, uh, oceanic birds, they say, 
uh, gannets. They have high aspect ratio wings shaped like those of sailplanes. And they live off these different air currents that, that come off of warming and cooling of water. That's, that's where they're at. Then the high lift wings are a lot of our birds of prey, ospreys, owls. And they list vultures here simply because they can pick up roadkill and fly over there and eat it if they want to. Most of them stand in the road and pull a gaco on you and see if they can pick you up a red. Vultures, hawks, eagles, owls, and ospreys, they can carry heavy loads. They have that, they can carry easily, I would say, twice their own weight. That's how power, how much power is in their stroke. Then we get into migratory routes. Now there's gonna be several test questions over those different, what you wanna know is examples of, of birds that fit in each one of these categories. That's, that's, there's your test questions out of these categories. Now migratory routes, since birds vision is their best sense, migratory routes gonna be something that they can see. And something that's really easy to see is some type of waterway. Mississippi River, Arkansas River, Poto River, we're in Poto, Oklahoma. And typically along these kind of routes, there'll be food and there'll be water and there'll be shelter of some kind. Now, you can read through all what they say there. And in essence, that's, that summed it up. Now, the time it takes for them to migrate may be different. There's some that, and I swear, they, they should really separate these into males and females. There's some that said, well, I want to migrate today. I made it last year in three days and 48 minutes. This year I'm going to make it faster than that. Is that males or females? That's male. Yep. We're not going to stop. We're not going to sightsee. We're going to get there and beat last year's record. And we're not asking directions. That's a male bird. <laughs> and we may, somebody told us of a shortcut. We may try that. Try to shave some time off, right? The shortcuts are always the killer. And then you have those birds. It says others, however, make leisurely trips often stopping along the way to feed. Some warblers are known to take 50 or 60 days to migrate from their winter quarters in Central America to their breeding areas in Canada, male or female. They're stopping along to feed, they're shopping. They're sightseeing, they're enjoying it. They probably had to stop and pee 14 times on that trip, but that's just the way it goes. So the landmarks, Something they can identify with sight is what they're following. So a waterway, a coastline, river, stream, that's what they're going to follow. Now, stimulus for migration, day length. There's your bottom line. Day length is your stimulus. As days become longer, that stimulates migration into their summer grounds where they're going to reproduce. As days become shorter, the ones that migrate then will migrate to their wintering grounds to a warming area. It's day length, bottom line. Yeah, they could have left out that whole paragraph and just wrote day length and been done with it. That's exactly what it is. They do some explanation of how it, it involves hormones. Uh, it involves uh, body storing fat. It's all involved there, but day length triggers it. Direction, finding, and migration. In, in birds in general, it's pretty instinctive. But if a bird's already been there and done that, would you rather them drive this time and you ride instead of you trying to find the way since you've never been there? So experience plays a huge role. And usually the experienced birds will guide as long as they can. Unexperienced birds will follow. Next time they may guide because the old experienced codger may not be able to see anymore or he's dead, who knows. But they have an instinct clock or instinct direction finder built in a nice compass. But they'll let the experienced birds do it first and they'll continue to learn and build on their compass from there. Uh, direction finding. As far as how birds know where to go, we already said we use landmarks. Some, some say here that uh, birds use celestial cues. They use stars by night and sun by day. Well, a day like today would be a little rough on them, wouldn't it? Can't see the sun. So some <clears throat> they use a magnetic field, maybe. Who knows? So what have we really learned from that section? 
that we really don't know, do we? All, all I can tell you is they get there. Think the any of them ever get lost? Oh, absolutely. You know, back when we was talking about fish, uh, fishes coming back, salmon coming back to the original stream and laying their eggs, you think any salmon ever get lost? You know, we never did figure out how they got back from the ocean to the parent stream, but once they got to the parent stream, we used a, a reverse odor, odor map. Well, I doubt birds use odor maps to get to where they're going, but see, in the fish situation, if they never found their parent stream, but urgency comes upon them that we need to find a place to spawn, we need to find a, a freshwater stream, but we can't seem to find what was home, then they'll, they'll take a freshwater stream. Well, what does that establish? That establishes more fish in that stream, or it may be a stream that's not been used much at all, and it establishes fish in the stream. So it's really a good thing, and same thing with birds. They, they may broaden their horizons of where this species of bird now lives because one got lost and survived just fine, made its way back, and now more follow it there. So it could be a good thing. It could scatter more food sources, more shelter sources, more water sources, more whatever they need and it could increase the species. Social behavior and reproduction. This is a, this is a topic getting here toward the end of this that uh, social behavior plays a huge role in, in reproduction. Birds of a feather that flock together, for instance. Now, not only does that play a role in defense and survival modes for the birds, but it's much easier to find a, bait, a, a mate when there's a whole flock of birds to choose from instead of being a solitary single bird flying forever just to find another one of the same species. See what I'm saying? So they use the term birds of a feather flock together. Many birds are needed, uh, highly social creatures. Birds are probably one of the most social creatures out there when it comes down to it. Bees in a bee colony, the flocks of birds, herds of antelope, those are all uh, social communities, if you will, and I have some social community questions on there, I believe, that all have benefits of that sociality, uh, and reproduction is one of those. There are some conspicuous exceptions here. It says uh, that these are highly social creatures, especially during the breeding season. Seabirds gather, often enormous colonies, to nest and rear their young, and that, that is huge. Gulls, uh, a lot of those are huge colonies. Uh, land birds, with some conspicuous exceptions, such as starlings and rooks, tend to be less gregarious or less socialized than seabirds during breeding and seek isolation for rearing their brood. Now, they may not rear their brood in large groups of birds, but starlings in the wintertime will be pretty large colonies. They'll find their mate, then, then they'll leave the group as the group breaks up, as they find different mates, and then they'll be solitary and raising their young, is all they're saying. They're not saying they run around by themselves year round because they don't. Starlings are in large groups. So togetherness offers advantages. Mutual protection from enemies, greater ease in finding mates, less opportunity for individual strain during migration, and mass huddling for protection against low night temperatures. So there's a variety of reasons why they do this. Certain species, such as pelicans, use cooperative behavior <coughs> to feed. So at no time are the highly organized social interactions of birds more evident than during the breeding season as they establish territorial claims, select mates, build nests, incubate and hatch eggs, and rear their young. So birds are extremely social and they're extremely territorial. Extremely territorial. The reproductive system. I think we'll stop right there. We got a little bit of a late start, but we'll stop right there and uh, We'll begin today, Thursday. We'll choose.